My name is Nadia. Uh, I'm an engineer from Stockholm. And the story I'm about to tell you starts in 2011 when I was working for the Council of Europe. Set against a backdrop of rising unemployment amongst young people and rising discontent with the society that our parents built, um, my team was tasked with putting forward uh, proposals for how to reform European youth policies. And we started out by casting citizens as experts. Um, the reason being that the citizenry as a whole will have a different and richer outlook on the problem space than any government agency, uh, large NGO or corporate actor can have. Um, and so we thought it made sense to uh, look, <laughs> look for knowledge about what was happening uh, amongst the young amongst the young, rather than a small group of credentialed experts. Um, we decided we would, we would, we decided we would roll out a, a radically many-to-many -many participation exercise. Um, we thought of it as a think tank that would be distributed. Um, we wanted people to be able to participate from wherever they were, uh, collaborating over a an online virtual workspace. We needed it to not break down as the number of participants grew, so it needed to be massively collaborative. Remember, Council of Europe, 47 member states, lots of ground to cover. Uh, we wanted anyone who cared about the issue to be able to participate without Council of Europe filtering, so it needed to enable self-selected participation. And we wanted to emphasize personal stories and experiences as opposed to opinions. We find that the former are richer and more generative, maybe also less controversial than the latter. Um, we think this approach is superior than um, you know, the, the traditional way of gathering a small number of credentialed experts. And, and you know, the, the key lies in the openness. So, Openness, we, we know from the open source communities and the free software movement um, from Wikipedia that open processes are more robust to errors because when you have lots of people looking at something, lots of people watching, errors are spotted earlier in the process before it becomes too expensive to fix them. And in the democratic arena, Openness generates legitimacy and consensus. It's very difficult for anyone to complain that they've been excluded when the door to participate has been open all along throughout the whole process. Um, you know, when you have thousands of people collaborating over the internet, that generates a lot of content. Um, and it can be quite a challenge to aggregate it into a coherent product. Um, we won that challenge by using quite sophisticated methods. In order to find the connections between the different stories and the information that was being contributed by the participants, we used ethnographic software. And in order to, we, we used uh, network analysis to uh, determine which questions were most widely debated and which conclusions were validated by most people. What we came up with, what, we, what this process generated was a unique outlet on the situation of young people in Europe today, as seen from the trenches where young people fight for a future every day. Um, you know, we found that there was a lot of innovation happening amongst young people. That the innovation support system was nowhere to be seen. And the third was that, yes, we're critical, we're involved in protest movements, and we're collaborative. So people are generating, people are innovating left, right, and center. We are couch surfing, ride sharing, co-living, co-working, and trying out all kinds of collaborative living. We are engaging in, um, we're engaging in urban farming to support our communities and provide food resilience. We are playing around, we're experimenting with cryptographic currencies. All of these experiments are generating lots and lots of notes to compare. Let me give you a few examples. 
Matthias has been building Earth OS, an operating system for the planet for the past three years. He thinks it will enable us to reduce waste while living autarkically or independently and still maintaining a reasonable standard of living. This year he's prototyping it while living and traveling out of his customized firefighter truck. Elf has not touched money or identification papers for the past three years. He doesn't do it because he's crazy, and he certainly doesn't do it because he has to. Elf does it because he believes that a non-transaction-based economy would be more liberating for people. He is experimenting on himself and discovering needs he wouldn't have known about otherwise. His long-term goal is to develop software to enable more people to do the same. Alessia is active in mobilizing businesses um, to refuse to give um, to refuse to give uh, extortion money to the mafia, and she does this by uh, encouraging them to step forward and publicly refuse to do so. This has two effects. The first is that it makes it easier for consumers to support these businesses over other ones by taking their business there. The second is it encourages others to step up and refuse to put up with organized crime by showing that if you do it, nobody will come after you. There are so many stories, so many people in the edge riders community. I wish I could tell you about all of them but we don't have the time. But I'd love to tell you about them later. Come talk to me. <laughs> so, the second discovery. <laughs> now, in Europe at least, we have extensive systems of support for innovation. We have government funds, we have incubators, accelerators, we have um, venture capital, we have all kinds of support, right? This system has generated a massive effort on social innovation and social entrepreneurship. Even branching out in specialized incubators, we have uh, impact investment funds, we have, um, we have ad hoc legislation. Now imagine our surprise when we found out that of all the stories told, of these radical young innovators, nearly none reported having had anything to do with these. Actually, in the contrary, it turns out that a lot of the times they found them inaccessible. It seems that these actors don't find value in, in these innovations, which is strange because it seems intuitive that these innovations are valuable, at least from a social point of view. Why is this? We don't know. Some people reported that Perhaps it's because the Silicon Valley approach of we're going to change the world by making lots of money really fast has captured the discourse in innovation. Um, we know, you know, if you, you go to a mentor and you say, I have an approach for ending or lowering domestic violence, the first thing to ask is, what is your business model? We know where this is coming from. Yes, we should be striving for sustainability. But maybe we've gone so far into trying to monetize social solutions that the most creative stuff is falling off the grid and happening under the radar. Secondly, um, you know, <laughs> it's possible that disruptive innovation is, well, you know, disruptive, mm. and um, that it is difficult to evaluate even in theory. Why? Well, evaluators try to gauge the value of an innovation according to the world in which they live in, in which the innovation doesn't exist yet. Whereas innovators try to build the world which contains the innovation, the future. Evaluators are accountable to the present, whereas innovators to the future. Maybe they can't agree. So where is it that young innovators, radical innovators at the edge of change are getting their support? Well, it's primarily from each other and from the three Fs, you know, family, friends, and fools. Mm? <laughs> and you know, another discovery was that there is very little, if any, investment in these kinds of networks of mutual support. Apparently, with youth policies, the tendency is to try to come up with design solutions from the top and then try to push them on young people, as opposed to asking, how are young people currently trying to navigate the contemporary situation and the future building exercise, and asking, how can we help? 
The third discovery is that yes, we are critical. Yes, we are involved in protest movements from Occupy to Anonymous. And yes, we are willing to collaborate with all kinds of actors, including governments and large organizations, if they come up with propositions that are meaningful and respectful. Um, you know, Exhibit A being edge riders. It was born out of the Council of Europe, which is a bureaucratic organization. It's, um, it's built on treaties between states ruled by diplomats. We managed to get constructive, generative dialogue with people who don't acknowledge the nation state. They think it's a bad idea. So, as the project, um, as the Council of Europe finished its, its work, it decided to terminate the project. But by then, connections had been made by thousands, between thousands of people all over Europe and beyond. We saw that people started collaborating, lots of cross-border collaborations, and, and there were you know, over 20 projects that we knew about, and we keep discovering more. Um, you know, one of them, um, oh, I should tell you about this one, actually. One of them is the, is the Unmonastery. It was an attempt to create a space where, um, where people could uh, dedicate themselves to solving social problems in a community, even when these didn't have any market value. Uh, it was conceived of at the first community meeting last year at the Edge Riders Conference, and within one year it went from concept to prototype, even informing the policies of the Italian city of Matera that is hosting the first one. Uh, this is another example, Expedition Freedom. Petros, that guy, uh, traveled over a thousand kilometers to Greece. Um, he wanted to make a documentary about uh, the efforts of long-standing Greek communities of mutual support in weathering the crisis. Um, he came across communities that were doing things like urban farming, um, food distribution systems that cut out the middlemen, and so on and so forth. And his idea was to build a documentary that enables others, like-minded uh, groups all over the world, to reappropriate the obvious skills of the Greeks in building long-lasting communities of mutual support. Is this cutting-edge development? Yes. Is Petros an economy, uh, a development economist? No. Petros is an ex-ICT entrepreneur. He went bankrupt in the crisis. Um, you know, he not only lost his job, he also lost his home. He had put it up as a deposit for the banks, for the, for the, company's, uh, for the company's loan. Um, and officially, he's homeless. But thanks to cheap solar panels, open source resources, and land that he can use in Eastern Europe, He's actually doing okay and leading a really interesting life. Petros actually sees himself as trying to help others in the face of a global crisis. Uh, and this was done with the support, financial and in kind, from others in the community who don't really have that much money themselves. And um, one of the most committed members of the Edge Riders community won the European Social Innovation Competition this year. Um, his project, as now adapted as an edge riders project, um, is basically a network bartering algorithm. Its aim is to keep local economies going, even under severe liquidity constraints. Um, it's called the Economy App, uh, moneyless living for the 99%. And so, um, you know, when, when the project ended, uh, the, some of the most committed members of the community saw a real value in these collaborations and many more that we saw springing up and decided to put their own money and their own time and resources into keeping the community going. A new platform was built and hosted. Um, I quit my job at the Council of Europe. <laughs> I was like, this is, ah! Oh. Um, and we decided to set up uh, a social enterprise to keep the community going and thriving. Um, Edge Riders LBG would sustain itself by providing open consultancy services. Um, open in the sense that it would provide knowledge work derived from networks of skilled, generally young people. Um, and what, what Edge Riders would provide is 
authoritative and truthful advice to decision makers in public and private sector uh, organizations. So authoritative um, comes from, the, the authoritativeness would be derived following a process and a logic that's quite similar to how articles are built in Wikipedia. And the truthful part comes from the fact that most of the work done on edge writers on the platform is done by volunteers. Most of us are not on the client's payroll. So we're going to say what we think to be the truth rather than what we think the client wants to hear. Um, so what are we doing now? You know, we're, we're trying to get this business going. The first, uh, the first client was a think tank founded by former deputy governor of the Swedish Central Bank. They approached us asking us to help them draw a sketch of how young people are navigating the current situation in the Baltic Sea region. We're currently uh, collaborating with the UNDP, helping them follow up on a, on, an open cons on a consultation exercise they did about development goals after 2015. Um, we are actually helping the Italian city of Matera put together a cutting-edge bid for uh, European Cultural Capital 2019. Um, and as I leave here, I'm preparing a presentation for Angel Fair. It's a by invitation only platform, matchmaking platform between emerging African entrepreneurs and, and investors and actors like Omidyar. Um, oh, we're also, we're also building uh, an event in October called Living on the Edge. And its aim is to upskill and capacity build so that participants can do many, many more projects with the ambition and scope of the Unmonastery project. And it's community, community powered. Which brings us to you. So, <laughs> what can you do to help? Think of a problem, think of a challenge that if solved, would make a contribution to the world. And let us help you. We're building we're building the sustainability of edge riders on client work rather than going after funding. And there are two reasons for this. The first is that by delivering value for money, we're less, uh, we're less vulnerable to funding fads. And the second has to do with credibility, with increasing the political traction of the community and its young people. Because if people are paying us for our advice, they're more likely to take it seriously. Um, and what we're looking for is people who want to partner up with us as, as active agents for change together rather than giving away some pocket money. Um, and so we think we have a viable proposition for a partnership for change between established organizations and radical communities of young innovators on the internet. Um, you know, we deliver. Um, it's value for money. Uh, we have well. The main thing is really that you know we have the tools. Uh, we use ICT-based. Uh, we use science-based ICT tools to generate, uh, manage, and aggregate information. And really, the ball is in your court now. <laughs> Thank you.